Hello, it's Jake Beeman with Golden Fox Farms. We need to talk about something that is urgent in the apiary this time of year, and that is swarm control. Uh, to understand swarming, you need to know a little bit about honeybee genetics and the different tricks we can employ as beekeepers to keep those bees in their boxes. Now, we have a swarming video that we published recently on our channel. It gives you a brief overview of what swarms look like and the reasons why you might want to avoid them. So swarm control. First off, we must remember swarming is colony level reproduction, and it is very hard to totally arrest it. There are tools we can use that can slow it down or redirect it, but anyone who says they never have any swarming is just lying to you or themselves. To understand swarm control, you must understand queen mandibular pheromone and its effect on the bees. Queen mandibular pheromone is produced in the mandible area of the queen, and certain variables can cause that pheromone quantity and concentration to increase or decrease. The more QMP in the hive, the less inclined the bees are to swarm. Queen mandibular pheromone, or QMP, is the colony is queen right signal. It is highly labile. It breaks down very rapidly, but is not volatile. It doesn't blow around in the hive. It is spread around the hive by the retinue, the attendant bees, especially the liquors. Colonies can realize they are queenless in less than 15 minutes because that QMP concentration rapidly collapses once the queen is removed. Now, there is a seasonality aspect to swarming. In my region, swarming peaks in May. It can start as early as mid-March if you have someone feeding bees. Uh, it can go into June, but really it peaks with May. Uh, it's related to crowding in the hive. Uh, bees can sense crowding uh, within their colonies. The heat goes up and the ventilation goes down, and the amount of queen mandibular pheromone they're encountering goes down. Uh, there's also another aspect to this uh, seasonality, and that is this is when we will have colonies get honey or pollen bound, is May and April, where resources are coming in faster than the bees can get it out of the brood nest. So that brood nest becomes plugged out, laying stalls. When laying stalls, QMP production stalls. Swarming urge rises. Genetics-wise and subspecies-wise, we should understand sometimes the best tool for swarm prevention is having the right bees. Certain subspecies and hybrid lines of bees are more or less swarmy than each other. Carniolians are considered very unlikely to swarm, or rather the least likely to swarm, while Africanized bees swarm at the drop of a hat. Depending who you ask, Italians were a less swarmy line but in my experience working with them, I really can't say they are swarm resistant. That said, switching for one of the less swarmy stocks is a pretty surefire way to reduce swarming pressure in your apiary long term. There is also a tendency to split colonies when you see swarm cells. If it is early in the season, in total honesty, you're better off applying other swarm control methods first to build a larger population. The bigger the population you have before you have to break that colony apart, the more resources you're going to have for those resultant colonies. It also tends to push the queen rearing or virgin mating steps into a later part of the spring season when weather is more reliable for getting that queen mated. Another thing to realize is how often these colonies will go into swarm mode. Usually it's a one time a year event when they actually punch through going into swarming. If you keep them from swarming they tend to kind of creep backing into swarm mode as the season allows them to. Uh, when a colony decides to swarm around 90% of them will uh, they'll launch that primary swarm, and about a week later, about 80% will launch a secondary, and something like 60% will launch tertiary swarms. Uh, so they will try to really increase their colony numbers. This is how 
They populate the earth with additional bee colonies and make up for overwinter losses. Generally, if you keep a colony from swarming all the way up through and past that swarm season and get on the back side of the population curve, usually they will not swarm for the year. Worker bees use queen mandibular pheromone to evaluate the queen. Queens also evaluate themselves with QMP feedback. They can smell it coming back to them. And this is part of the regulatory system for if the queen will lay in queen cups, setting up her own replacement, be it by swarming or by supersedure. To manage swarming, you must manage queen mandibular pheromone. And there's a couple ways to tweak it. Uh, younger queens produce more queen mandibular pheromone than older queens. So if you have younger queens, the bees are less inclined to swarm. So some sound advice would be to refresh your queens. So you always have relatively new queens making your colonies less swarm prone. A queen that is laying, especially a queen that is laying a lot, produces more QMP than a queen that is not laying as much. That can be driven by the queen running out of space to lay or issues with the food supply for that queen. So one of the great ways to keep your QMP high is making sure that queen has open comb to lay in. Another aspect of QMP is the less bees in a colony, the more QMP per bee there is. So they have less drive to swarm when the colony is a smaller population. You can also increase QMP by having more than one queen, which is the last set of tools and tricks we'll talk about. Now there's a number of management techniques and traps for keeping your bees from swarming. One of the most useful options for swarm control is getting bees out of the hive, or at least out of the brood nest. This can be accomplished through a couple different ways, such as equalizing, pulling nukes or splits, or for vertical or internal splits of the colony population. Equalizing should be the first real population management you do in the spring, where you rob bees from strong colonies and put them into weak colonies. This defers the swarming in the strong colony and juices up those weak colonies. Uh, a lot of times this little trick is the difference between having a strong colony that swarmed and dinks that don't do anything to instead having a bunch of strong production colonies hitting their stride at the right time uh, with and after the honey flow. I myself like to rob frames of capped brood from strong colonies because those are fully invested by that colony. So they push the colony you're stealing it from back pretty significantly and they very strongly boost the colony you're giving them to. You do want to be sure that if you're donating brood to a colony that they're Bees. There's enough bees in that colony for them to keep it warm uh, because a lot of times we're doing this when we still have chilly weather fronts coming through. If you give a large frame of cat brood to a small colony and the ends are you know, not controllable, uh, you'll have a chill kill on that brood, uh, which is not in anyone's benefit. Another layer to this is sometimes those dinky colonies, they're slow to build because they just have too small a worker bee population. A lot of times what actually limits the queen's laying ability is the amount of nurse bees she has to maintain the brood nest. So this can actually really spike up the productivity of these smaller colonies. Uh, another tool to prevent swarming is giving the bees more space. Uh, supering draws nectar up and opens up the brood nest. Now we're really talking about supering with drawn comb. You can super with foundation. They'll start pulling those, uh, but it just doesn't work near as well as having drawn comb. And this is a trap a lot of new beekeepers land in is without drawn comb, sometimes you're just stuck with having some amount of swarming or performing some amount of splits. On an aside, these are supposed to be illustrating 10 frame boxes, trying to have 10 colored frames indicated in these boxes gets really busy really fast. So I've simplified it down to each one of those blocks represents two frames. 
don't get hung up on these specific details. Look at the bigger picture on these things. There's also reversals, and reversals are a really handy trick, not only in the beginning of the season, but also in the middle of swarm season. Uh, the classic reversal is all the bees are in the top box in a double box system. So you rotate it. You put the top box in place of the bottom box, and that puts a bunch of open comb above the bees to work up into. So any nectar that comes in goes up as opposed to in the brood nest. It does work. It is effective. You do need to have all the bees in one box to do it safely when we still have chilling temperatures. Uh, so it's limited in the number of hives you can use it on. When it is cold and we can't reverse, we still have options. And that is something I call shuffling. This is where we'll carefully maneuver a open frame of comb and put it parallel next to the brood nest. What that allows is the brood nest can continue to expand into that open comb, but it also keeps you from isolating part of the brood nest and inducing a chill risk. Now realize when doing this, you need to be able to leave enough food in the vicinity of the bees so they won't end up stuck. Uh, realize these images are all simplifications. Usually brood frames have food rings on them and the bees can handle this uh, when done right. However, as we get into the stride of swarm season, when you have strong colonies, you can split the brood nest. You can perform a reverse and go from having a, you know, a round ball of brood to having something more of an hourglass shape of brood. And what that does is it opens up the area between those chunks of brood nest for the queen to lay into. And is a way to buy more time before that colony reaches terminal strength and swarms. You can also fold open comb into a brood nest that's getting clogged. Uh, finding a frame of open drawn comb and sticking it right into the middle of a strong hive's brood nest when it's warm enough to do so gives that queen a couple days of laying in there and can spike her QMP back up and delay that swarm urge. In years past, uh, especially 2023, as we had another swarmageddon season where swarming just came on strong and early due to weather conditions, I had colonies hanging queen cells earlier than I wanted them to. And I would just perform a reverse, steal a brood frame, and insert an open frame in the brood nest. And those colonies would call their own queen cells and reset. So each time I did that, I got another two or three weeks of safe operating time before they would start to get to that mode again. Another trick is ventilation. This is one Cornell talks about in their program. It's a dicey one. Uh, if you ventilate a hive or give them more ventilation, it can reduce the sensation of crowding the worker bees experience and in theory reduce the swarming urge. However, as ventilation increases, we're going to probably see QMP concentrations go down in the hive, so it's not a straightforward proposition. You're going to have both a decrease and an increase in some aspects of the swarming calculus. The other aspect is removing the queen from just the brood. Uh, this is actually the approach that uh, Demarie came up with in the 1890s, and it remains a viable tool. Uh, basically, you perform a vertical split where you leave the original queen and one or two frames of cat brood in the bottom box, and you shift all the other bees and brood to a top box with an excluder between them. When you do this, all the foragers will return to the bottom box as they do their work and rapidly repopulate the bottom box, while most of the nurse bees will stay up topside with the open brood. What happens with this is that top box believes it is queenless because it no longer has queen mandibular pheromone being transmitted around inside of it. So they will go from swarming mode to emergency queen replacement mode. Now, this does mean the top box will build queen cells, and they will launch queens and swarms when the time comes. However, you can go into that box after 
eight days and scrub all the queen cells and keep that box perpetually queenless. Uh, because there is open brood in the bottom box, it's going to be wafting its vapors up, its pheromones up. That should keep you from developing worker ovaries and keep you from developing a laying worker situation. It is a pretty powerful tool. Uh, Demery, when he talks about doing it in Kentucky, talks about just doing one big swamp right with swarm season, and that's enough. Other resources would tell you it is a perpetual activity where you have to keep going into that bottom box and keep stealing brood out and keep moving open comb from up top down. Uh, only only your experience in your area will tell you if it's viable or not as a one-time shot or if it's a repeated task. Another note with the Demery method, you want to make sure you don't have spare queen cells anywhere you don't want them. When you separate the brood into the upper box, if you donate some frames to the bottom box, check those for queen cells because if they have a queen cell, they can still swarm with that original queen down there. This summer... I intend to implore a riff on the Demery method where I will do that vertical split and create a queenless box with its own entrance uh, above a super above the brood box that has the original queen in it. Another option is splits. Splits is the simple act of taking one established colony and cracking it out into two or more colonies. Uh, usually when I'm doing splits, I'm also rearing queens, so I tend to split them and make as many colonies as I practically can because the more colonies I have trying to get queens reared, the more likely I'm going to have enough good queens come back. Now, with splits, uh, this is getting to things where we're going to be separating brood and bees from each other, so you need to be cognizant they have to build these colonies strong enough to survive the weather they're going to encounter. Uh, other aspects of this, a five frame nuke box with three frames of brood suddenly has, you know, nine frames of bees when that brood emerges. So you have to be aware if you build a rather strong one of these splits, it's going to blow up on you in a couple weeks. And another aspect about splits or any of these methods where additional queens are needed, if you're trying to make your own queens, you really need temperatures getting into the 60s to have real success with your queen mating. Queens need a little bit warmer temperature to go on their mating flights than the other bees do. So it can be 55 and bees flying for the 10 days of your queen's mating window, but she still can't get out. You can do all of these split methods far earlier if you bring in or have spare mated queens. Uh, there's just the issue of getting those queens. Lastly are multi-queen systems. These increase QMP in a hive by just having more queens. Uh, and you can also generate huge hives using multi-queen systems. And the bigger the colony, the more honey production you are having potentially. Uh, there are several different approaches to this, uh, and really saying there's several is an understatement. There are dozens and dozens of different ways to approach multi-queen systems. I will cover three of them. One is what they call a double queen, and this is two brood boxes operated side by side with a common super above them with a queen excluder isolating the two brood boxes below. Each box has its brood frames accessible from the sides. You can do inspections, and the bees work collaboratively to fill those supers. It can produce a lot of stuff. It reduces the height of the overall colony compared to some of the other multi-queen methods. Uh, it works. It's viable. It's a viable approach. Uh, another is what they would call a multi-queen, and really multi-queen just means it's we're going vertical. And this is a naming convention that's been pushed by Alan Wade, who has a great book on multi-queen um, systems, and an exhaustive book on multi-queen systems. With the vertical multi-queen, you usually will have a queen in the bottom box and a queen excluder isolating her from the supers, and somewhere in the super stack is another brood box with its own entrance and another queen. 
this again allows you to produce twice the number of bees for the terminal colony population. You have two queens worth of QMP pheromone being produced to reduce that swarming pressure. Uh, you can make huge crops with this. Uh, I admittedly did these uh, last year and the year before. Uh, you can still have them swarm. They can still swarm on you just because they're just so strong. Uh, and they are mammoth swarms when they do so. There is also the Snellgrove method, or what we call Snellgrove. Uh, its naming convention is a bit contested. Some say it's a Snellgrove 2. Some say it's a double screen board with gates. Uh, so let's call it a double screen board method. This hive here is an example of a double queen using double screen boards uh, in a Snellgrove type method, or Snellgrove 2. What that board is, is a double screen. So the bees can't directly touch, but smell and heat transfers through. And it has these things, these wingdings, these gates you can open and close. What these gates allow you to do is you see how this one here is open? That one's been open for about a day. And the bees rapidly learn to use that entrance. But let's say I wanted to cycle the bees to the lower box. If I close that one and open that one, all those forager bees that remember this spot will come back and go in at the lower entrance. If we open another entrance for this top box on one of the sides, a lot of times the forager bees will fly out, not reorient, and then go back to the old entrance spot and go into the lower box. And those foragers are just using that top entrance so they don't clog up the brood nest in the lower hive. And it also exhausts bees out of the top box. So it reduces swarm pressure. So this can produce some really outsized honey crops and it's really useful if you're doing stuff like uh, comb honey. I will say I have noted a downside using this method and that is you'll get pollen foragers putting pollen into your honey frames and you really don't want pollen in honey frames. Pollen is a very bitter thing to add to your honey supply. A word of warning about the Snellgrove method, you usually end up with the second brood box on top of the super stack. The issue with this is you can end up with an 80 or 90 pound brood box six feet up in the air. And it is super hard to handle that safely. Uh, it's actually one of the big reasons why I'm probably going to move away from using the Snellgrove method even more so than the pollen and supers issues I was encountering. Now there is a trap when it comes to swarm control, and that's feeding. We should always feed to prevent starvation in our colonies, more or less. If you have a client that's getting ready to starve because they have the wrong genetics, well, it's on you to change those genetics next time, but that's not a reason to kill those bees through starvation. Uh, the issue is you can also overfeed these colonies and put them into swarm mode even faster. Uh, again, swarming is driven somewhat by the size of the bee population, so if you spike it up by feeding, they're gonna swarm earlier. Early swarming is not your friend. It can be a real detriment. Uh, another layer to this is feeding too much can cause them to clog the brood nest and create a nectar or honey bound situation where the queen can't lay, which will induce swarming in itself. This is also kind of why I hazard about trying to get bees to build comb with feeding. To get bees to build comb, you really need them to more or less run out of spare comb space and they have to build comb. They're very reluctant to build comb if they don't absolutely have to. The problem with feeding them to that level is you're going to be putting a lot of feed into a hive and you can induce swarming by doing so as you plug out the brood nest or build a sky high population. So that is just one of my concerns about feeding for comb production. I primarily get comb produced by either putting foundation on swarm colonies because they love building comb or folding in a couple undrawn frames into otherwise drawn boxes. And they're usually drawn pretty rapidly, especially when put in the brood nest during the right times of year, May and later. A classic bit of swarm control advice would be to go through the colonies every week and remove queen cells. Uh, if you constantly keep them from being able to produce a queen, generally they will not swarm. But this is super labor intensive and easily fails if you just miss a queen cell. One of the issues you'll have is usually the queen cell you miss is the worst queen cell in the hive. So they'll still swarm and now you've got a rinky dinky queen you'll need to replace. Uh, 
sometimes I've found if you if a hive has gone into swarm mode and they're swarming, sometimes you're better off accepting the loss in terms of make splits. Don't try to keep them in one colony. Just accept the fact you're going to have them swarm or split them. And splitting is a more controlled and more reliable way to keep your bees. With that, we have covered swarm control and how to manage swarming in your apiary. And I'll say good luck and happy beaking. All right, now we'll reassemble everything and feed them as we need to.